Okay, uh, a very warm welcome to everybody um, to this Emancipatory Future Studies in the Anthropocene uh, webinar and seminar platform. Emancipatory Future Studies is premised on the idea that the subaltern, the oppressed, if you like, have answers to all the big problems we face. Uh, this new knowledge project uh, walks on various legs. It walks on the leg of rethinking climate temporality and what it means for our societies and, and, and the rhythms of life, uh, everyday life. Um, it, it walks on the leg of decolonizing futures. Um, it walks on the leg of thinking about um, green utopia and dystopia. And it walks on the leg of systemic pathways into the future. Uh, as well as grand ecocentric futures. So it really think about futures in a very, very different way from mainstream future studies and thinking, which abstracts from trends and um, kind of uh, magnifies that to, to, to have some kind of predictable predictivity. So we are doing something different in this space. And uh, the project now has been running for just over two years, and we invited both practitioners on the front line. And last time we had Miriam Myatt, one of our leading food sovereignty activists in the country, uh, informing us the front line practice. But we've also had uh, uh, academics, and um, today I'm very, very proud um, that we are hosting Roland Gam. Roland was the first doctoral. Uh, fellow of the Emancipatory Future Study Project. Uh, he's developed the University of Free State and later the University of Advartis Runt. He's an NRF scholar. He got his PhD at WITS. His thesis focused on revisioning, re revisioning of coffee cooperatives within climate change, deep globalism, and accelerated financialization of agriculture value chains. And I'm proud to say he was my PhD student and he did an excellent job. He was extremely focused and disciplined and did a great piece of work. And I'm hoping he publishes it at a, as a book. Uh, after graduating, he journeyed with us in this program, as I said. And, uh, and he, he, he's now um, working at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation as a program manager for climate change and social ecological transformation, looking at Southern Africa and the Southwest Indian Ocean. And um, he's been doing a lot of work around amplifying uh, voices on the continent around climate justice. Uh, Roland's main interests include climate justice, revisioning African economies, especially rural economies, democratization of power grid, grids and degrowth. He's a firm believer in commoning cooperatives and more broadly democratic subaltern socioeconomic alternatives. In other words, Roland believes that the oppressed can can think and they have uh, knowledge and they have answers. And um, I'm now gonna hand over to Roland, who will be talking to us on food systems. Roland, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Vish. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, welcome to this uh, uh, lecture. I think the first thing I'll say is that uh, there are some images that might uh, shock and so, uh, uh, if you see something that is uh, a bit sensitive, you could uh, just look away for a minute um, until we uh, switch over to the next uh, slide. So I'm going to start screen, screen sharing. And please just confirm if you can all see uh, my screen. Yes, we can. And I'll try and uh... okay. So our talk today is really uh, the political economy of food regimes in a heating world, and uh, we are going to um, after that uh, present some subaltern alternatives. And really, we need to start this uh, conversation by talking about uh, agrarian political economy. 
And the reason why we are doing that is because it is uh, important to, to historicize as well as to uh, try and uh, compartmentalize uh, definitions uh, so that we better understand the kind of uh, concepts of the world we live in. Uh, although sometimes uh, these definitions uh, and compartmentalizations uh, do not really uh, do justice to uh, the kind of um, things that we are talking about. And I'm going to uh, show you one very good example when we get to the end of uh, food regimes as we present them in this uh, talk. And so what is political economy? Political economy is really comprehensive set of policies that help us understand uh, concepts. And so for example, if we talk about liberalism, what is liberalism? Um, uh, this is a kind of policy uh, which focuses on the triumph of personal initiative. And so you could have a polity that is based around um, this kind of ideas. In the area of agriculture, uh, Bernstein gives us uh, an interesting definition of agrarian political economy, which really is about looking at who owns what, uh, who does what, uh, who gets what, and what do they do with it, okay? And so we are looking at different aspects, including hermeneutics. Hermeneutics here really is definitions. Uh, how do we define uh, economics? How do we define the economic actors? How do we define uh, production systems and so on? Uh, who owns capital? And where does this capital get deployed to? And so on. And so um, to jump straight into food regimes, uh, Harriet Friedman, tells us that um, it is really a bounded historical period uh, with complementary expectations uh, that govern uh, the social actors. And here we're talking about uh, uh, those who work the land, those who own the capital that structure uh, production systems, those who own the manufacturing systems, uh, those who extract money and so on um, and so forth. Now, Food regimes really examine political economy within a stable and transitional periods, okay? And we, they look at the agro-food dimensions of uh, geopolitics. And this aspect really, really is very important because uh, agriculture shaped the modern world. Agriculture shaped or invented even, if I can put it that way, Africa. And here I'm talking about modern Africa, uh, the concept that we have now. And so the first food regime that really uh, structures global geopolitics uh, is the British centered food regime, which starts around the period where, uh, with the industrial revolution, and uh, this is the period where global temperatures uh, start rising. Okay, and so this is really the first time where we have commercialization of the soil. Uh, we have um, forcing up of production of food and organic raw materials to serve the needs of rapidly growing uh, industrial and urban populations. It is also the first time that we see uh, this system really get extended overseas to colonial territories. And for example, uh, we have in Africa, uh, the creation uh, of the first plantations, uh, plantations for sugar cane, uh, which are then, uh, which then become incubators. And those ideas are transferred to uh, uh, the Caribbeans, uh, we see the spread of the first coffee plantations in the Caribbean and so on. The importing of guano uh, to fertilize uh, plantations and all of that. And all that with the capital being sent back to the global north. And this really is a system that displaces people as well. Um, 
takes Africans from one continent to the other uh, across borders as well. And really we start seeing the systems of uh, exploitation that uh, we know today. And some quick examples, uh, commons quickly replaced by capitalistic freehold measures. Uh, we have uh, deployment of capital because some of these companies really uh, had many shareholders. Um, we should not look at this as individual plantations owned by uh, single owners. Many of these entities were companies uh, owned by uh, thousands of people in some cases. And so we see inherent contradictions. Inherent contradictions here, for example, because suddenly you have uh, people who are participating in a production system, but who have no control over it. Okay, the uh, rise of global temperatures, like I mentioned earlier. Um, now we also notice gender, age, class differentiation. Uh, before we have the structuring of the agricultural systems, as we know it, it at that time, in many cases, the food crops were grown by men. But suddenly, with the introduction of plantations and uh, latifundia and so on, the men are suddenly shifted to produce cash crops, whereas women are relegated to, relegated obviously, um, to, to food crops and less productive, uh, uh, less revenue generating activities. And so, um, Another aspect that we have to mention here, uh, which obviously uh, shaped modern South African history, is the fact that we have companies that are set up to uh, manage production. Uh, for example, you have the Compa Compagnie Française L'Afrique Occidentale, CFAO, which today has diversified and is uh, into cars, they sell cars, they sell buildings, uh, the own shares in aviation companies and so on. You have uh, the Société Commerciale uh, Industrielle et Agricole du Autogwe, which is really uh, modern Gabon. The modern Gabon state is really this one company. Of course, uh, we have others, Dutch East India Company, which uh, everyone who is involved in South African economics uh, should know. And so all of this really um, are about what the colonial state is. So the colonial state redistributed land, determined who should produce what and how. Um, it had administrative instruments uh, obviously designed to break up uh, uh, traditional social relations and so on and accelerates, it creates and accelerates uh, the process of uh, proletarianization. Now, uh, more examples, so you can see this map of Africa. Uh, our mass transit systems were created and are still structured by what you see here. The fact that uh, most of those uh, trains, uh, networks, uh, telegraph networks, et cetera, were designed only to uh, evacuate commodities. And at the same time, we have a small black elite, which is also in charge of the administrative processes. And the reason uh, why I mentioned that uh, Comprado elite, uh, I will come back to uh, later. And so uh, like Mujimbe says here, uh, although generalizations are dangerous, it is important uh, to note that um, the colonial system uh, determined and organized non-European areas into fundamentally European constructs. Now, that's one of the images I mentioned earlier, which uh, it's a bit sensitive. Uh, so everybody had to produce, you did not have a choice. Uh, you either produce, you either join the plantation work and so on, or uh, 
you were punished in this uh, sort of way, uh, like you see the image there. Now, um, once again, remember that these are production systems that transform human beings into beasts of burden and uh, women are really, uh, for those who have read African uh, history, you will have noticed, for example, in Ibn Battuta's narratives, uh, that he was really shocked to see that we have these systems of equality uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and what Sankara is saying here is that colonialism really comes and relegates the woman into a second class uh, citizen, a, a more or less a beast of burden uh, with a human face. And all of this happens uh, as the systems of exploitation are being created uh, because really uh, those who were given importance in society were those who uh, were strong enough to uh, pick cotton all day, uh, uh, till the land for groundnuts and, and so on. Um, and I come back to something I mentioned at the start of the lecture, the fact that statism really is a commodity production construct, okay, for the production of palm oil and rubber and cocoa and beeswax, sugarcane, and so on. And so if you go back to the map of Africa, although we often talk about uh, mineral resources and so on, the jackpot really is uh, the commodities. And that is really what the global capital is flowing into Africa for, um, to create the, the latifundia and um, which are exploited by the comprado bourgeoisie uh, who break the backs of the peasantry uh, to produce these products. And, just to confirm that if you look at the maps of all a new Africa, you can see that new Africa really is structured around where the commodities are. Now, the second food regime, uh, uh, this is the US centered uh, food regime, which is characterized by dumping of cheap food disguised as food aid uh, on poorer countries. Um, Africans are encouraged to eat more nutritive foods like uh, powder, uh, milk, ch hot chocolate, uh, glucose, etc. for break at, at breakfast. You have import substitution, industrialization uh, policies uh, that replace export oriented industrialization. We have uh, specialized companies that are set up in Africa to uh, uh, develop flour mills, uh, sugar mills, uh, etc. And a very good example is uh, GMP in, in Central Africa. This company came in through Cameroon in, at the uh, behest of the Cameroonian president um, uh, to uh, produce wheat flour. And with very little investment, uh, this company today controls uh, the flour market in the entire Central African region. They also control uh, most of the brewers. Uh, in that part of the uh, continent. Uh, a lot of investments go into Green Revolution technologies. Uh, cooperatives continue to be used uh, and mentored, uh, to mentor rather, uh, small-scale producers. Now, there is accelerated loss of commons, commodification of a subsistence continues, uh, breakup of the rural uh, countryside, uh, exploitative measures uh, continue. And this is something I alluded to, which we see throughout um, all the food regimes and uh, which will be one of the uh, arguments that I make at the end of this presentation, uh, namely that most of rural Africa remains stuck in the first regime, uh, even though uh, food regime uh, scholars will talk about three dominant uh, uh, regimes over the last uh, uh, century. Now, the coercer, exploiter and beneficiary of the second food regime really is black and he hides his uh, plunder under the veil of uh, nation building. 
And what is the result? The result is failed uh, policies. Uh, uh, the World Bank imposing structural adjustments on most African countries, um, imposing um, privatization, uh, also imposing uh, policies for African countries to open up their markets to imports, okay? The small holder farmers uh, really lose everything because these were the people who uh, were propping up their economies, uh, cooperatives that were propping up economies that were really the biggest uh, companies in um, most of Central and West Africa uh, collapsed overnight. Uh, deep global globalization dumped cheap food in Africa, devastation and desolation. And what is the result? Uh, farming, Ethiopia, uh, Mali, Niger, Burkina, Burkina Faso, many countries really uh, spiral into shocking, shocking uh, collapse. And the response from government is unprecedented brutality, uh, less democracy and generalized uh, austerity. Okay, uh, obviously, uh, these are some of the things that uh, some of you have alluded to. The fact that um, most governments directed the use of land to uh, ways that were really not beneficial to national development. And the kind of disaster that, uh, that engendered was generalized structural adjustments in the 80s and 90s and the kind of austerity which most African countries have not really emerged from. Uh, the third food regime, very uh, quickly. Uh, this is really peak agrarian capitalism, increased supermarketization. And a lot of this really concerns only the small uh, bourgeoisie, uh, okay? Agricultural science and technology in, uh, in, in production, corporate concentration. Um, now we just ha we have 2% of, uh, farms grow over 50% of the food in the world. But once again, a lot of this really is consumed only by the small bourgeoisie. And in Africa, this really concerns only about 25% uh, of the population. The majority of the population, peri-urban, rural, is still stuck in, uh, in, 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 in the first uh, food regime conceptualization. And so we also have, false solutions emerging, like the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, which encourages farmers to buy expensive fertilizers, GMOs, and so on, uh, to have this bumper harvest. Uh, a lot of this really has not materialized. And those who have been following agricultural production in the global south have uh, must have heard of the uh, suicides committed by uh, many farmers, uh, in Africa and also in Asia, because they cannot uh, pay back um, the money they borrowed to buy GM, GMOs and so on. And so uh, we have this pervasive characterization of smallholder producers as uh, enemies of growth, enemies of development, when we know that uh, smallholder producers uh, are responsible for more than six, uh, 60 percent of the food that is consumed uh, in the world today, because of the austerity of the uh, third food regime. We have civil servants who uh, fall back into precarity and become uh, smallholder uh, producers. Now, um, what are the emerging trends in Africa Global North relations uh, throughout these food regimes? We have environmental plunder, exploitative labor relations, systematic sucking of African petty commodity producer surpluses uh, by uh, a comprado elite and uh, mon monopoly, uh, organized monopoly capital located in the global north. And so you still have rural producers who produce a lot of commodities like cotton and so on, which keeps uh, leaving the continent, okay? And now, so one of the things that we have seen uh, recently and which 
keep plaguing our economies, keep holding them back. The GDP growth obsession. We have people who work all the time to earn the kind of, uh, to earn their subsistence, but who barely get by because they cannot afford medical care, they cannot afford uh, the fees for their kids uh, to go to school, ecocide and so on. Um, and like Franz Fanon and Amikral Cabral say, most of the development initiatives were located in a small sliver of urban Africa. And so for the past century, most of rural Africa has been left to its own devices. And some of these things uh, manifest themselves in some of the looting uh, that you saw over the past week uh, in, in South Africa. And so those are the kind of things that have to change very quickly um, for us to have a, a better continent. Um, and so we really need to stop looking at ourselves as hapless victims uh, of some eternal forces uh, of the Illuminati and so on. Um, yes, it's interesting to share uh, videos uh, exposing Dependista view, uh, the Dependista views on social media, uh, Professor Lumumba, and many others. Uh, those are good ideas, but we, we should have gotten past that a long time ago. Okay, we also need to move away from prosperity evangelists and so on. What we need now is uh, systems transformation, okay? And the solution that I offer really is uh, degrowth. Why do I offer that? Because the Rostovian growth path uh, to uh, the traditional society and transforming that into the age of mass consumption, that kind of development model really uh, will lead, only lead us to chaos, okay? And obviously for illustrative purposes, we cannot replace 1 uh, billion combustion engines with 1 billion uh, EVs. And so what do we need to do? We need to have a kind of a paradigm, okay, which is based on a holistic mindset, okay? Uh, moving away from the fixation on GDP and productivism to focus more on individual well-being good eating, good health, happiness in a clean, healthy environment. We need to manage our resources better. We need to prioritize commons. Uh, the idea of uh, handing over water to, 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 to private companies, uh, we need to roll all of that back and eliminate tax havens. Uh, we need to have greater transparency uh, in financial uh, transactions and so on. Um, really at the micro level, we have to focus a lot on reinventing the kind of cooperatives that build Africa, uh, the kind of cooperatives that uh, created the structures of that underpin our economies to, uh, today and expand this. Um, in, in most African countries, sub-Saharan African countries rather, uh, people still uh, trust their cooperative a lot more than uh, the state. And so we can expand this to schools, cooperative schools, housing, electricity, banking, and so on. Although uh, most people really uh, in urban areas do not believe that these things work, uh, they are still very, very powerful cooperatives today. We need to reinvent the idea of local markets and move away from the concept of shopping malls um, that some African countries are slowly uh, adopting. Uh, Reimagine local community production. Very interestingly, the other day, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa was suggesting the idea of African countries uh, that uh, where people come out to clean their streets, uh, clean, clean uh, their offices and so on, uh, community work. And it is, interesting that countries uh, like Rwanda, et cetera, do this uh, on a national scale, others uh, to a lesser extent. Uh, but then the reason why these suggestions are being made, um, 
really uh, is because that community collaboration still exists and still works. Um, and just for illustrative purposes, some of the biggest companies in the world today are really uh, distorted cooperatives. Uh, WhatsApp, for example, really you have billions of people uh, investing, but only a few people are pulling out all the money. That is why I say it's a kind of distorted cooperative. Uh, but then uh, the idea that President Cyril Ramaphosa is mentioning, those are the kind of things that Rwanda has invested in and which is really uh, making it a kind of global success story. Okay, so we need to introduce a shorter work week, um, uh, promote agriculture that also promotes our well well-being, uh, less exploitative work, uh, prioritize shorter value chains. And we also need a kind of new internationalism. Uh, this is uh, I'm at, almost at the end of the presentation. And the reason why we need a new internationalism is that the kind of agriculture we should do uh, should be on our own terms. And we have international uh, partners who really are ready to pay a fair price uh, for our commodities. And so uh, within new international uh, structures, uh, we have a better uh, chance at shortening our work week and spending more time uh, doing the things uh, we love. And obviously, Keynesian policies uh, like the Green New Deal and Agriculture Green New Deal, I have put out two papers on the agri on an agriculture Green New Deal for South Africa. Uh, you can find that in the Daily uh, Maverick. And so we really need to define the kind of development uh, that we want. Uh, and uh, I thank you. Uh, the photo you see there is really one of the biggest cooperatives in, on the African continent on the top right. That is the Oromia Coffee Cooperative. Um, this just to show you that collaboration can create uh, major success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roland. Um, that was just fascinating. And um, you pulled it all together brilliantly. So yes, it's open for comment, engagement, questions, put up your hands, um, or you can ask in the chat line, but yeah, we'll, we are gonna enable this conversation. So feel free to, to engage. Who wants to go first? Any hands? Oh, anybody wants to ask anything? Please, here's your chance. Ron, maybe you, I'll just break the ice. Maybe you want to say more about degrowth and the agricultural um, uh, Green New Deal, I think it is. You, you said you wrote about and you've, you've argued for, yeah. Yeah, so uh, degrowth really, uh, in recent times, there have been a lot of questions about uh, trickle down neoliberalism and how that has uh, taken us to the brink. And more and more countries and experts have been questioning uh, neoliberalism and offering alternatives. And certain countries really have adopted new models of uh, measuring success. Uh, Nepal, for example, which introduced the Global Happiness Index. And this really uh, leads us to the kind of collapse that we, we have seen in uh, many global North countries uh, post-2008 and um, really incredible uh, scenes in France, for example, after, right after an election where uh, the country is really shut down by the uh, gilet jaune because uh, people say that we are suffocating, we are dying, we cannot, we uh, 
cannot live from month to month uh, the way we are. Our salaries really cannot uh, pay our rent, uh, children's fees, and so on. We need something new. And so uh, the solutions that more experts have started offering is to go back to the kind of communal systems that we that we have always had and which uh, work in many uh, situations. Uh, uh, in Spain, for example, we have the Basque community that really is based around uh, cooperation. Uh, most African systems, really, if you think about it, um, the governments in most countries have really uh, failed their people. And uh, healthcare, for example, uh, social care, all those things are really offered by uh, communities. And so degrowth really is not zero growth. Degrowth is a kind of better growth, moving away from uh, GDP, living in harmony with the environment, living in harmony with your community and with the people um, around you. And so this really becomes very, very important um, as we uh, move into the fourth industrial revolution, because more and more, fewer people are going to control production systems. And if that is happening, uh, how do we, what do we do for the majority that really uh, cannot find work, that cannot uh, afford uh, to pay for um, all the things that they need to pay for? And so we have to start thinking about these questions more. Um, and deep growth really offers us the kind of answers uh, that we are looking for. Thank you, Roland. Um, let's see, there's one or two other engagements. Uh, Alia says, really fascinating unpacking using food regimes. Helen Chapel um, asks, would it be possible to talk financing technology to enhance productivity? What is the role of capitalist economies in this sense? Uh, fund innovation technologically, but not exploiting the products of their funding. And then I'll bring Charles in after that. He's got his hand up. Yeah, so, um, so, so really, although I mentioned uh, subaltern alternatives, and although this uh, lecture was focused on the subaltern alternatives, I start giving some hints. Uh, to the kind of solutions that we need to uh, start developing. And uh, the first answer really is setting up shorter value chains and prioritizing shorter value chains. Um, when we do that, we, we uh, gain more than we lose. And I'll explain why. Uh, if you go to your local supermarket, you will notice that a lot of the uh, products they have been uh, imported from, from far away. And so when we invest in uh, local production and industrialization that meets our needs right here, right now, it means that we expand our, our economies uh, quicker. Secondly, we do not need to reinvent the wheel as in producing things that uh, could be produced uh, cheaper somewhere else. And so that is why we need a new uh, form of internationalism, a new form of internationalism that respects ecology, that respects uh, work, that respects uh, uh, workers' rights, that is democratic, uh, uh, and so on. And so um, to uh, in, in summary, we have a new form of internationalism that we can promote, as well as short value chains uh, that we should promote and invest in. Hey, Charles, you wanna come in? Let's enable Charles to speak, Jane. Uh, hello, Vish. Hi, Jane. Hi, Charles, go ahead. 
Uh, Roland, thank you so much for, for that very incredible lecture. Uh, mine is, 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 is more of a comment on how we really need deep growth, especially in a South African context in our agriculture. If you look, for example, at commercial agriculture in South Africa from 2007 to 2017, you find that there have been more than 11,000 job losses, according to state's essay. But in the same period, that's that 10 year period of 2007 to 2017, profit went up from 85 billion in 2007 to 338 billion in, in 2017. So if, if you are looking at it in, in, in the narrow GDP analysis, you will say there's been a growth in agriculture. But actually, there hasn't been a growth in agriculture, commercial agriculture. There have been significant job losses. So this is not just a, 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 so this, this a commercial agriculture is, is, is not only failing to create jobs, failing to feed the poor, but it is so vulnerable to climate shocks. For example, in South Africa, we have 67% of our bananas produced in one place in, in, in Pumalanga, in Tlanzi. So if you have a, a drought in that particular area, prices of food are going to skyrocket. So the solution really, as you say, is in small scale farmers who are feeding 70% uh, of, of, of the human population. So the, the, the solutions lie with the super 10. The solutions lie with the small scale farmers, commercial large scale industrial agriculture, which uh, is, is responsible for large scale em uh, carbon emissions, 60% of methane. Is, is really not the solution and not the, and not what we need, especially in this in, the, in this current uh, climate crisis. Uh, thank you, Roland, and thank you, Vishal. Thanks, uh, thank before you, you respond, so before you respond to that, maybe you want to uh, uh, just pick up on Alia's comment. I would be interested to know in Roland's idea of the immediate next steps when trying to bring about the proposed solutions. As mentioned, they are based on the core of existing community collaboration cultures. But how do we bring about this transformation, especially engaging directly development finance institutions who are stuck on GDP? Yeah, so I don't know if you want to also deal with that as well in your response. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Charles, for, for uh, those comments. Um, we talk a lot about uh, GDP and South Africa, for example, is I think uh, the 24th uh, biggest economy in the world. But then at the same time, we still have a situation of uh, overcrowded townships uh, living in uh, deep misery and uh, ticking time bombs. And you saw the kind of explosion that we had uh, last week. Uh, you also have a situation where uh, really a situation that is uh, unsustainable uh, with drought and hundreds of uh, thousands of people have reduced their production over the past uh, decade in South Africa because we are in a multi-year uh, drought. And so the solutions to many of these things, um, another statistic that I saw from Stats essay the other day, uh, 3 million South Africans uh, do not even have access to electricity. Uh, and so the solution really is investing in uh, well-being. And to segue into uh, uh, the, the, the second question, uh, Cuba, for example, um, is a world leader in the area of health because they chose uh, the well-being of their citizens. It is, that, that was a, really a deliberate choice to invest and have the best or one of the best healthcare systems in the world. And so how do we expand some of these subaltern uh, alternatives? It really begins with uh, 
one person uh, meeting and discussing in their community and slowly scaling that up. Um, uh, for example, a few people who get together and say, we want to start a community market and they found, for example, the Victoria Yards. Uh, that, that is an example that we are seeing all over Africa. If you drive all over uh, rural South Africa, you will see many in many small towns, uh, these festivals uh, uh, where people bring out food, they bring out books, uh, music, and so on. And those are the kind of things that we really need to scale up. And fortunately, very, very fortunately, uh, because even in, at Davos, uh, the people at Davos who uh, were pushing trickle-down economies uh, for a very, very long time, they themselves are seeing that the kind of economic models that they created are unsustainable. And so um, we are seeing the emergence of more capital uh, funds that are ready to invest in community initiatives. We have over the last couple of days seen uh, some companies announce that they are going to pull back uh, some of their uh, production chains uh, to uh, their countries, um, invest in local communities. And we, see, we are seeing more and more of this uh, in almost every country in the world. The kind of uh, USA-China fight, uh, those are the kind of things that uh, 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 underpinning those decisions. And so um, it, it really begins with starting in your community and slowly scaling up. And for example, the reason why President Cyril Ramaphosa is talking about communities coming out to clean together is because he has seen that these ideas work in Rwanda, for example. So it was really, uh, one community doing something good and then it was expanded and expanded uh, and today we have uh, more buy-in at international level thank you roland um are there any other engagements with roland comments questions um Roland, in terms of the green revolution on the continent, uh, okay, somebody else asked here. Thank Donna. Thanks for this, President. Could you speak to some of the convergences between degrowth and alternatives, such as provisioning, commoning, subsistence, sufficiency, corporatives, bin vivir, and African eco-feminist articulation? So, so yeah, how, how does it, it kind of uh, intersect and come together? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um... Uh, Thomas Sankara really started uh, talking about uh, uh, this a lot when he became uh, president. Uh, the fact that we really needed to start going back to, because when we talk about degrowth, these are really uh, economic models, going back to the economic models that we had in our communities before uh, structured global capital, the capital uh, came in and uh, took over. And so, for example, uh, one of the really uh, terrible impacts of capitalism was the erosion of uh, women's rights. And uh, degrowth really uh, offers alternatives uh, because it is really about democracy because uh, community institutions really generally are a lot more democratic. So we're talking about uh, democracy, equality, equity, um, very, very important, not just equality, but equity. And really uh, uh, offering solutions that improve people's lives um, where they are, uh, reducing consumerism, uh, pro protecting uh, indigenous uh, knowledge and, and solutions. And some of the examples that I'm going to uh, give here, um, one of the 
programs that were developed under the former president, uh, Ilima Lecheva. Uh, Ilima Lecheva is something that exists all over West and Central Africa. And this is, this uh, are really uh, production systems where communities come out together to till the land, to uh, build houses, and to take care of uh, the children when some of the parents have to go away and so on. And these are really deeply democratic institutions where uh, women's rights really um, are uh, protected uh, because outside in the capitalistic and new uh, models that we see, uh, they tend to be really uh, parochial and, and patriarchy uh, still dominates. And so when we go towards the kind of cooperative relationships uh, that degrowth offers, uh, we see that there is a lot more democracy and uh, protection uh, of women's rights, of uh, the youth uh, and so on. Thank you, Roland. Um, are there any other final engagements with Roland? Um, Roland, I just wanted to ask about the Green Revolution um, and where that fits into the making of the sort of African food regime, um, if you want to just say a little more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the paper really is focused on subaltern alternatives, but uh, the subaltern cannot be uh, expected to do all the uh, heavy lifting. There has to be at some stage uh, a coming together of uh, the micro and the meso and the macro. And how that comes together really is through uh, developing of the kind of infrastructure that uh, people really need to live uh, decent lives. And this is really the subject of uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz's uh, uh, book, Is There a Post-Washington Consensus Consensus? And in there, he makes the arguments that with the structural adjustment, African countries were uh, simply uh, ordered to uh, dump companies, privatize everything, and, and just leave. And the reason why we have been stuck in this uh, austerity and uh, protracted period of no growth is because um, the, the kind of infrastructure that uh, people need to succeed in the global north um, does not exist in Africa. And so for an ag agricultural Green New Deal, for a green revolution to happen, uh, for a green uh, new deal to happen in general, we need infrastructure, we need roads, we need um, uh, water supply, we need proper um, uh, electricity. Which, so the, the, the kind of uh, energy poverty that exists in Africa, uh, we have to do to, to find a way to, uh, uh, to solve that problem. We need proper education, uh, human development, um, and, and so on. And so uh, Keynesian policies are really, really important uh, to help us emerge from uh, where we are today. And so um, the one example I give about um, Cuba deciding to invest heavily in, in uh, healthcare, those are the kind of examples that we need to focus on. Uh, African countries really need to, to, to pick uh, about four or five priorities and say, right now we are going to end energy poverty, we are going to uh, invest in human development, we are going to build roads and bridges and so on, uh, so that people can uh, get on with it. Thanks. There are the two final uh, comments uh, or questions. Faisal Kala asks, can degrowth engage without debt or maybe finance from the IMF? And Donna is asking about, you know, uh, the connection between degrowth and ecological debt. Um, so maybe this is your final bite and then we'll wrap up. Over to you, Roland. I think... Unmute. Yes, thanks. 
uh, I think really um, there's the kind of subaltern alternatives that we offer uh, have to really show their effectiveness on the ground. And we have seen that they are really effective in the countries that are really investing heavily in those aspects, countries like Rwanda um, and so on. And when that happens, generally, uh, they create the kind of conducive climate because uh, remember that a new internationalism really uh, will operationalize a kind of cooperation with like-minded countries and institutions. And because the solutions on the ground are working, we also have at some stage, as has been uh, seen in Rwanda, countries stepping forward and saying, okay, we are going to cancel your debt or we are going to postpone or reduce your debt and so on, because we see that the measures that you are putting in place are working. So uh, that is really uh, very quickly uh, the answer to the first question. And, and to the second question, deep growth really is about reconnecting with the environment, reconnecting um, uh, and, and living a more uh, sustainable lifestyle. And because we have those more sustainable lifestyles, uh, we have healthier communities and healthier environments. And so deep growth really is, is about uh, if you will, a new kind of environmentalism. That is an, an environmentalism that doesn't offer false solutions, that really respects the, the rights of Mother Earth. Sorry. So yes, that was great, Roland. And um, there's a lot of food for thought here um, around how we think through the the political economy of agriculture and how it relates to degrowth and, and a host of other uh, systemic alternatives. Um, so there's some fertile uh, issues here for us to interrogate further and, uh, and explore. And, and Roland's pointed us in that direction. He's also given us this great framing. He's translated the food regime uh, framework that has been used uh, to the African context and to really understand the agrarian transition. And this kind of analysis is very, very important uh, because the political economy of food is going to, it is uh, impacting on a host of challenges facing our societies. Uh, as we've, as, as he's mentioned, uh, if you look at how South Africa's political economy operates, well, it doesn't feed millions of people. Uh, and of course, going into the pandemic, that was exacerbated. We have 30 million people in food stress. So Roland has really kind of given us a framing where we can locate various institutions, regulation, and broader social practices around food, food regimes uh, in the African context. Um, I must also say that uh, I love the slide with the co-op. And I must say something about that. Um, again, uh, in practice, we can build alternatives now uh, based on solidarity. We can institutionalize them. Africa has some amazing cooperatives and, and, and um, uh, Oromia is one of them. Actually, we went to see Oromia in Ethiopia. And, um, and so, you know, in Tanzania, there's amazing co-ops. In Cameroon, there's amazing co-ops. I mean, the finance co-ops on the continent are very, very important as backbone financial intermediation institutions. And um, that's a whole exploration in itself. South Africa has a Cooperatives Banks, Banks Act, uh, which we haven't utilized to build uh, community controlled pools of capital or even workplace controlled pools of capital. But anyway, Roland has, has pointed us in this direction. And again, a very, very big thank you to you, Roland, for making the time for this extremely uh, stimulating engagement. And I'm sure everybody is, is excited to think further on the issues that you, you've brought to the fore. Take care, everybody, and stay safe. Maybe I should just also let you know, we'll be having an academic from India in August as well. 
speaking on decolonizing theory, but that information and that notice will go out shortly. Take care. Roland, stay safe. Thanks, thanks. Bye.